Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is actually a video that I'm really happy and excited to do because it is one of my favorite things to do in 3D modeling, which is rendering. We're in Fusion 360 today and we're actually gonna be talking about how to change the settings for your rendering environment. It's a very, very important skill and, and feature to be able to know how to use. And so we're going to jump on over. So we've got these two little pieces. These are actually pieces I made for a little electronic device I was working on actually earlier today. Um, and I think they're gonna be great for showcasing much of this feature. So we're gonna click on this feature right here, scene settings. And we have a little workspace screen right here that's gonna pop up. So first and foremost, we have brightness. Brightness is measured in Lux, I think is how you pronounce it, L-U-X. Um, so we have a thousand Lux. It's illumination. It's how much light um, the objects specifically are going to bounce off or receive. In in a lot of ways, it's very, very similar to um, the brightness, which exposure, sorry, which is right there. Um, but there are some, some very, very slight differences. Uh, and you're going to see those differences with different materials and things. So position. Honestly, I'm not very keen on how Fusion 360 has put this. I personally would put position first. It's one of my, my, when I'm rendering is what I typically go to very, very beginning. And so what you do is we'll click on positioning and then we have the slide bar, which is a rotation of the environment, the lighting environment. So we can control the shadows, but we also can control the ground offset. And so if we go up, we can see we're controlling these shadows on the ground. We go down, same thing. Um, yeah, they're both very, very powerful and very, very important features, but I wish they just had them right here. I don't see why they had to have them this separate area right here personally. And so we're actually, for right now, I'll leave the ground actually kind of cutting this in half to kind of showcase some other stuff. So we're going to click on that. For the background, we can use a solid color, which right now is just gray, but you can change that to, let's do a kind of an orangish. Yikes. Yep. Let's go back to gray. Um, let me go a little lighter. Yeah, we can also click OK. We also, for the background, choose the environment. And when you're clicking environment, it's actually choosing the lighting environment. So when we move this around, you can actually see there's the spotlight or the, the soft lights, um, all the different blank spaces. There's your lighting umbrella. So yeah, so it's just using the environment itself. Some lighting environments are actual like photo environments of like being outside and so you can actually sometimes use the same lighting environment for your background photo for let's say putting a car on a road or something so let's keep definitely keep that in mind i'll talk a little bit more about those kinds of environments a little later so for the ground we're cutting our parts in half and that's because we have the ground plane turned on let's say we turn it off you can see your parts again but we do lose the the shadows that are cast onto the ground we still have those shadows that are self or cast on themselves or cast on on um other parts and so if we there you go you can see that shadow being cast right there from the green part but we do lose that ground shadow so bringing that in flattened ground Honestly, I've never really seen much of a change in terms of the flatness of the ground. I don't really know why they have it there. Um, I mean, you can see it's changing in the color a little bit, but beyond that, I don't know. And I've used a number of rendering programs, and I've seen it in pretty much all of them, and all of them, to me, look like the ground's flat before you flatten it, but it's there. Last, we have the reflection. This is a really, really important feature, and especially if you're trying to make something look realistic. Um, so we'll click on that, and you can see we have this nice reflection kind of coming off, and that just adds a nice depth, uh, and just, a, I don't know, another level of reality to your images when you have that. I, I really, really like that. Obviously, you don't always want to be using it, but if you're going to be putting something on a metal table, for example, or an image of a metal table, it's going to reflect. And so it really just adds a nice nice level of reality there. And we can also control the roughness of that. And so the more rough, the more, um, I guess, vague of a reflection we have, whereas the more smooth, the more crisp of a reflection. So really, really fun feature. I really, really love that. Camera. Uh, I love all of this stuff. I do photography myself on the side. And so some of these things are, are, are I think, are really great, how they just pretty much just use 
photography terms. So for the camera, we can choose the views. And so perspective view, that is what we see reality as, is perspective. Um, and so there's a, a vanishing point in the distance. And so further objects get a little bit more warped and get a little bit more shrunken or, or, or pulled back, whereas closer objects are less so. Whereas orthographic, it takes away that vanishing point and things are a little bit more um, blocky engineering, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, a little less reality, but fits a little bit easier. In my mind, sometimes it's a lot easier to model an orthographic view uh, compared to perspective. But if you're trying to make something look more realistic, perspective typically is going to be the way you want to go. With perspective, oh, also they have the perspective with ortho faces, which is kind of a blend between the two. Um, with perspective, you do have your focal length as well. And that is because with, uh, or what a focal length is, I guess I should probably cover that, is, um, hmm, how to explain focal length. As we, we scroll up, you can see it's going to warp a little bit closer. We scroll back, it's going to be a little bit more flat. Um, great thing about focal length is it really just depends on what it is you are trying to achieve. And so I think if you're trying to get something a little bit more extreme, more a little action um, feel to it, you might want to drop the focal length down. And a good example of that would be comic books, actually. So like Spider-Man, if you see a, a comic book with Spider-Man on it, frequently his hand's going to be like really close to the page, but he's going to be a little bit further back. And it really gives a, an, a, uh, an effect of being there and, and a lot more action going on. And he's moving and he's coming in. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind. Exposure that is very similar to the brightness, but it's the whole environment rather than the individual objects themselves, which is what was happening with the brightness for the, I guess it did the same thing. I actually honestly don't know what the difference is between the two then. Um, I thought I had one thing, but I guess it's both. So yeah, if you know what the difference is, I'd love to hear that in the comments below. All right, depth of field. Depth of field is a really cool thing that I actually really love, especially in photography. Uh, kind of a way of explaining depth of field is you have layers of your, uh, let's say if you're looking at this object that you're currently looking at, you have layers from the very tip all the way to the very back. And the depth of view is which of those layers do you want to be focusing on? And anything further and anything closer is going to be blurred out a little bit. We're not going to get it in this situation because the part's so small, but I'll show another demonstration a little bit after uh, I finish going through these that really showcases that feature. And so uh, I'm actually just going to skip over that for the time being. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay, yeah, we can also do aspect ratios. And so this is actually like for your output image, what are you actually wanting? And so let's say square. Let's say you're doing something for Instagram or for social media. You may want a square image that's exported so you don't have to post process it in another program. And so you can really control the different ratios of the images that you're going to be exporting. You can also save your it's like save your settings, which is really, really nice and save them as default. So let's say you use the same settings over and over and over for a number of renderings, you can save those. And then you can also just go back to the original defaults, which I just did. Last, we have the environment library. So currently we're just using a sharp highlight, but we can really use all sorts of things. So here's a photo booth. We can just drag and drop that right in. And there'll be some subtle differences depending on uh, what you're using, but some may be very, very different. You can also have some of these where you're actually seeing that it's a landscape and they'll frequently use the lighting from the image or even just kind of superimpose lighting in the background that you won't see. And you can download those. I'll just download this one real quick and we'll drop it in and take some time. There we go. Um, and again, kind of like for the background, we can actually change it to the environment. And so you can see, oh, nice, we're out in what looks like the Mojave Desert. Oh, maybe not. There's water right there. That's probably uh, Lake Tahoe then. Yeah, so that is that. So we're actually going to stop here, and then we're going to go over to this other example right here. So this is a really, really big, really long piece that I made. Uh, it doesn't look like it, but it's, it's very long. It's, I don't know, a couple hundred inches long. Or 
100 inches. I don't know. A couple, I don't know, 30 feet long. So we're going to go into the render settings and we're actually talking about the depth of field. So you want to click a center of focus. When you click on this, it's going to give you this little guy right there where you can kind of move around where the camera is actually going to be focused on and where the rest of it's not. And you can also control how much blur there's going to be. Let's just make a, let's just make a one and a half. Okay. And so now when we actually go to render this, we'll do an in canvas render. You can already see that right here is more focused than up in the front or over in the back. And that is that depth of field coming into effect. And if you were to move this center of focus, you would move what part is going to be more in detail and what part is going to be blurred out more. And so that is a quick run through, I guess, of what depth of field is and how it works. But again, it only really works if you have a larger object. It doesn't work so well on smaller things. And that, I think, is all she wrote. So... If you like this video, i really appreciate it if you hit that like button. I do think with the comments, this is something that there, people should have a lot to say about because there's a lot of different things you can do, a lot of different preferences. I'd love to hear what settings you like to be using and for what situations. Uh, I really think it's, it's just such a wonderful feature and I love the rendering and this is just a great way to really make things realistic looking. So as always, thank you so much for watching. If you like it, hit the like, add a comment, and as always, keep modeling, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.